this again. Um, we, uh, I, just before we get started, I want to thank uh, especially, again, the other people um, who have been responsible for planning and executing this uh, conference. My uh, faculty colleagues in the Center for World uh, Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, Mike Buddy and Stan uh, Chuilo, uh, and the staff of the center, uh, especially, who, do, who really do um, all of the, the good work, Karen Kraft, uh, Francis uh, Salinel, um, Anna Kreutz, and there's, uh, I think, some more um, uh, student workers that are helping out as well. So thanks so much for making this uh, um, uh, work. We have a wonderful session to begin with uh, today on political economy, kind of leading in from uh, some of the provocations that uh, Michael Northcutt gave us last night. Um, and so we're going to continue along that line. And to introduce this session, we have Suzanne Foster, who is teaching uh, philosophy and environment in, in the philosophy department uh, at Marquette University. So please uh, let's welcome Suzanne. Technology, we're going to start with a speaker on screen. Uh, James Igo is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Virginia. His early research, conducted in the 1990s, engages the displacement of indigenous communities by parks and tourism in the East African country of Tanzania and in the Western United States. This work resulted in his first book, Conversation and Globalization, a study of parks and indigenous, indigenous communities from East Africa to South Dakota. In 2005 and 2006, he returned to Tanzania for a follow-up project, during which he began to document the emergence of a new kind of market-driven conservation. This work supported his contribution to the book, Nature Unbound, Capitalism and the Future of Protected Areas, with Dan Brockington and Rosaline Duffy. His latest research examines the ways in which circulating images of nature, or natural spectacle, supports the strengthening worldview that capitalism is the key to our ecological salvation. This work is taken up in his current book project, Spectacle of Nature, Spirit of Capitalism, how Images Connect and Disconnect Images and the Environment, which is forthcoming in 2015. Between 2006 and 2010, he also conducted field work on grassroots neighborhood recovery in post-Katrina New Orleans. Hello, everyone, um, and uh, thanks to all the organizers uh, for um, this excellent invitation. I'm, uh, Delighted to have an opportunity um, to speak uh, to this conference on global Catholicism. Just a quick caveat, I moved to the quietest place I could find. The uh, place I was in before was my office, which is usually the quietest place around here, but there's a, um, there's a flute and piccolo concert um, going on in my office. So, um, there's people tuning flutes and piccolos, which as you can imagine is not conducive um, to this kind of talk. But uh, where I am now, there could be an ambulance or a jet plane going by the window at some point. So if you notice we stop to let that happen, uh, that's what's going on. But hopefully no such thing will occur. <clears throat> the um, paper I would like to present to you today is called A Genealogy of Exchangeable Nature. It's a chapter in a forthcoming uh, volume uh, edited by Shirley Fisk and Stephanie Aladino. It's called The Carbon Fix. It's a multidisciplinary engagement with carbon trading that they asked me to write um, a conceptual piece for. But uh, beyond that, it also draws from a lot of work uh, that I've done with Bram and Dan Rockington and Rosalind Duffy, among others, that. Uh, culminated um, in the uh, 
conference, uh, Nature Inc. in 2011, um, and the uh, edited uh, compendium from that uh, conference is out now, edited by Bram, along with Wolfram Dressler and Robert Fletcher. Um, and if you notice that there's a great deal of overlap between uh, my presentation and Bram's, it's because we've been working together on these questions for so long. So with that uh, all being said, let me begin, and uh, what I will do mostly is, uh, is to read you from the paper, but I will at times stop to uh, add some commentary, and I will endeavor to stay within the uh, 20 minute limit that I've been allotted. Okay. In my culture, money is both our blessing and our curse. Money makes a world of qualitatively incomparable objects and services quantitatively comparable. It gives everything an exchange value or a price. Exchange value makes modern standards of living possible, and so money is a blessing. It is in this exact same sense that money is also a curse. Far flung suburbs connected together by superhighways full of cars, and cities connected by flight paths full of jumbo jets, all supplied by supermarkets stocked with products of industrial farms and libraries from all over the world. Such arrangements depend on exchange value, which is therefore implicated in our current environmental predicament. And here I quote a uh, geographer, uh, Neil Smith, from his uh, 1984 uh, book, which is really foundational to a lot of this analysis. It's called Uneven Development. And he writes, with the development of capitalism at a world scale, the relation with nature is before anything else an exchange value relation. Capitalist production is accomplished not for the fulfillment of needs in general, but for the fulfillment of one particular need, profit. In search of profit, capital stalks the whole earth. It attaches a price tag to everything that it sees, and from then on, it is the price tag which determines the fate of nature. And this statement is uh, so important to the analysis that I'm going to present here that I'm going to reiterate. The price tag uh, determines the fate of nature. So um, Smith's first claim is that profit is the driving force of a capitalist society. So if it's profitable to bring bananas from Ecuador, lamb from New Zealand, or flowers from Guatemala to U.S. supermarkets, then they definitely should be brought. If it is profitable for people to fly continuously, then they should. And indeed, as I was rereading this um, chapter this morning, thinking about it, I had to note as well that even for us to come together at a conference such as this, this would not be possible um, were it not profitable uh, in many ways. So, first point uh, profit is the driving force of a capitalist society. And and that is definitive of, of most things that happen in such a society. That would be the outside noise that was uh, running around uh, earlier. So this next point is that consequently, price determines the fate of nature. Carbon trading and a proliferation of similar trading mechanisms. Let me start again from, from where the horn stopped. Smith's next point is that consequently, price determines the fate of nature. Carbon trading and a proliferation of similar trading mechanisms seek to invert this relationship by channeling exchange value for ecological and social good. So Smith's assertion, the price tag determines the fate of nature, is still right there. But now it's reimagined such that the uh, fate of nature determined by the price tag, instead of being a negative one, will be a positive one. So um, I will, throughout this talk, uh, critically engage uh, the logic and efficacy of mechanisms like carbon trading and other similar uh, exchange mechanisms related to nature. It's not my main uh, point. My main point is that, um, and what I would like to show is that these ways of imagining nature are cultural 
which is something that anthropologists find very interesting. But in modernity, I've learned over time, the fact that something is cultural is often greeted uh, with uh, the idea that it's also impractical and therefore irrelevant. My position, however, is that nothing could be more practical or relevant. Culture mediates our perception of what is real, what is possible, and what is desirable. So just to reiterate those three points, what is real, what is possible, and what is desirable. And one of the things about culture being the medium by which those three things are mediated is that we often confuse reality, possibility, and desire. Okay. Our current zeitgeist, in which one is cast as uh, nature's salvation, turns on new models of the possible. By explicitly extending money's exchange value into the realm of nature, this zeitgeist seems to make a clean break with a pervasive cultural notion that nature is priceless and should be protected as such. One of my central arguments here, however, is that these seemingly new modes of exchangeability, of these seemingly new modes of exchangeable nature, are actually rooted in popular desires about nature as a realm of, of potential transcendence outside the mundane and unpleasant realities of modern life. So, um, quite a um, long-standing and, and um, large body of literature on this idea of nature as a site of redemption from modernity. What I'm arguing here is that this older understanding of nature is recycled into this new understanding of nature as an exchangeable medium. Okay? So, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to tackle this more recent history of how um, what I call nature for speculation in my um, in my article, Nature on the Move 2, which follows Bram's article, Nature on the Move, uh, in the Nature Inc. Um, collection. Um, so first I'm talking about nature for speculation, which I argue is a more recent kind of nature. And it goes like this. <clears throat> Abstract models of reality are, are the hallmark of cultural modernity. Geometry, Newtonian physics, and neoclassical economics are all modes of knowledge that turn on such models and deploy them to make modern life possible. Like the modern culture of which they are part, these models are universalizing. Laws of motion, detachment, and supply and demand seem to apply everywhere, regardless of contextual difference. Of course, reality is much more complex and diverse than such a worldview would allow, but this nevertheless is our cultural perception that these models are universal. At first blush, there is nothing particularly exceptional or problematic about this state of affairs in the larger scheme of human cultures. We humans, like all creatures, apprehend our environment via cognitive models of those environments. That's part of our evolutionary makeup. What matters for us and for all creatures is not so much whether these models, the, model, the cognitive models we make of our environments, accurately represent these realities in all their detail. Indeed, the models can't accurately represent reality in all its complex detail. If they could, they wouldn't be useful models. That's what makes the models useful for us, is that they filter out um, a lot of the complexity so that we can concentrate more on relevant features of our environment. And if we couldn't do that, um, it seems or there is certainly a great deal of speculation that, uh, that um, we would be paralyzed by the overwhelming complexity of, 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 of the unmediated universe. What matters most about human models of reality, and presumably those of other creatures, is whether or not they work for the purposes they are required. And this insight comes from uh, anthropologist uh, Levi Strauss as well as anthropologist uh, Gregory Bateson. <coughs> The problem Bateson argues is that um, humans are uniquely capable of making models that are at several removed from the realities that they portray. Abstract models can be the basis for new abstract models, which in turn can form other abstract models, and so on, till original correspondences between, real between model and reality become very difficult to trace, and this is what uh, Baudrillard called simulacra, which is popularized, of course, in the film 
the matrix. When uh, monoliths become detached from the realities that they're meant to um, present to us and therefore become mistaken for the realities that they represent. Bateson noted this mistaking, he, Bateson called this um, mistaking the map for the territory, and he argued, and I agree, that this is particularly worrying relative to unprecedented ecological destruction that humans are unleashing on the planet today. People in modern culture are connected to environments at multiple scales and locales, meaning that the socio-ecological effect of our activities and relationships are both far-reaching and impossible to see. We can't know, it's impossible for us to know all the effects of our activities on the world. We are thus exceedingly dependent on abstract models of reality with few practical means of verifying that. This situation has been compounded by recent trends in the global economy that favor abstraction over material reality. Money itself is, of course, an abstract model of reality, which imagines all goods and services as universally exchangeable. On some level, the abstract exchange value of money must relate to the material qualities of what gets exchanged, or what we might call use value. These are all basic Marxian insights. Since the 1980s, global markets have grown increasingly oriented to exchange values with little discernible connection to use value, such as credit, commodity, futures, and derivatives, which uh, geographer David Harvey calls fictitious capital, and which uh, Bram writes about uh, eloquently in his Nature on the Move and other works. And uh, one of the things that Bram notes in Nature on the Move is the ways in which the housing bubble sort of portends um, a, uh, a, a problematic relationship between use value and exchange value since um, the uh, investments that were being made in houses in the early 2000s were much more concerned about uh, their future value than with their use value, which would be, of course, for people to live in. And this created all kinds of paradoxes, like all kinds of neighborhoods and communities where people can't afford to live in houses and therefore many houses are derelict. Um, so what we wind up with ultimately, as I think we all well know at this point, is the uh, fictitious assets, the assets that don't correspond to anything in particular, then become um, toxic. So when all of this went down, the 2008 um, financial meltdown, which I'm assuming Brand will talk about in more detail, um, I was attending the um, World Conservation Congress in Barcelona, Spain, which is the world's largest and most important conservation event. That's a quote from um, the uh, Congress website. The tone and aesthetic of the Congress um, projected, this is a quote from something else that I wrote, projected along with Taj and Eves and Dan Brockington, um, the tone and aesthetics of the Congress projected growing synergies between growing markets and effective biodiversity conservation. So one of the big, what was really prominent in that event, which was a huge event, it was a mega event, there were like 10, 12,000 people there, was that there was this growing synergy between markets and biodiversity conservation. As part of a group of scholars investigating the convergences of capitalism and conservation, I was quick to note that high profile conference spokespeople were either silent about the collapse or urging attendees not to lose faith in markets at this crucial moment. And I'm, of course, not the only person who knows this. Ken McDonald wrote about it, Sean Sullivan wrote about it, and Robert Fletcher's written about it in a more recent World Conservation Conference. <clears throat> so for me, that moment in Barcelona in 2008 was where I really noticed first that these connections between capitalism and conservation were being much more openly celebrated than before, but also that uh, even in the face of signals that perhaps staking or, or, or pinning nature and the future of nature to uh, a global financial market was, was, was a bad idea, was being met with a lot of very quick maneuvering to uh, assure everyone that this was a good idea. So since 2008, um, what we've been witnessing is a scramble for natural capital, which Sean Sullivan in a 2013 article describes as 
same in nature uh, the trading, which of course riffs off of um, uh, Kathleen McAfee's earlier article from the turn of the millennium called Selling Nature to State. Um, this sort of uh, scramble to um, to to um, for natural capital has been useful in, in what Kevin McDonald and Catherine Carson call uh, global institutional realignments such as TEAV, which is the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, uh, which was an international initiative created by the GA plus five in 2007. And the, um, in the words of its architect, former Dutch bank, or Deutsche Bank director, uh, Pavan uh, Sukdev, TEAV is dedicated to reversing the economic invisibility of nature. This is a really crucial point, right? So the, the notion being, coming from this economist, that the economic value of nature um, was previously invisible and therefore needs to be rendered visible. So one of the main goals of these new realignments is to, to make nature visible in new ways. Keith's mission to make nature's value visible is enhanced by mechanisms like ARIES, which is the artificial intelligence, which is artificial intelligence for ecosystem service services, which is a web-based program designed to, quote, help users discover, understand, and quantify environmental assets and factors influencing their values. These complex arrangements turn on common sense cultural values, at least within the culture of modernity. People value money tremendously. Therefore, if you can show people that something is worth a lot of money, or even better, that they can make a lot of money from it, they will be more likely to value and take care of it. These are the basic assumptions behind these uh, realignments. These seemingly straightforward propositions turn on a surprising inversion of material and abstract. For according to their logic, nature's material use value seems abstract and inconsequential, while its abstract exchange value seems compellingly material and crucially important. And in the language and logic of this worldview, this exchange value is inherent in the nature that is undervalued to the tune of trillions of dollars, which must be plumbed by teams of ecologists and economists so that the exchange values can be brought to light and the work that really um, gets at this in, 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 in an extraordinary way as Sean Sullivan's um, article from 2009 called Imagining uh, nature of art, but the, the, the cultural poverty of imagining nature as a service provider. So all of this process of imagining nature as a service provider, or imagining nature as um, abstract value, depends on elaborate modes of representation, which include maps, and the quantification of ecosystem services according to elaborate future scenarios. The relationships of these models to exchange value and use value is more tricky and problematic than their cultural common sense would imply. Somewhere in there, somewhere in there, sorry, this sentence is not as well written as I thought. Um, okay, somewhere in there is the idea that exchange value will positively influence humans to take better care of nature. But before this exchange value can be realized, nature itself must be rendered exchangeable. Theoretically, we would accomplish this by documenting nature's myriad use values and putting a price tag on those. This in itself would be an elaborate undertaking, but of course the matter is complicated by the fact that, and this here is really uh, what I'm about to say is, uh, is why mine is Nature on Move 2, because this is coming from Graham, this is one of Graham's key points in Nature on Move 1, which uh, in most cases comes before this. Uh, but here's the point, which is Graham's point. Um, the matter is complicated by the fact that we would like to make sure that an underlying asset for exchange value can be realized by not using nature, and in this I have the word not underlined, and then I say it. For details, see Usher 2014, which is Graham's Nature on the Roof uh, essay. Such speculative ventures depend fundamentally on abstract mechanisms, which seem to have a life and logic of their own. And in another um, article uh, by uh, Brian Boucher and Robert Fletcher, they write about uh, karma trading. Um, it's a brand new article, which is called 
Um, accumulation by conservation of this pilot. So they're talking about um, the certification of forests and trees um, to um, provide carbon credits. And they argue once that certification happens, the credits are then detached from direct connection with the forest and can be purchased by anyone anywhere for the purpose of emission offsets and mitigation. Credits can be further traded, held as collateral for other investments, packaged with other environmental products and so forth. Over time, their value becomes abstracted from these use and exchange values of, for, of the forest parcel from which they were originally derived. So these vertical values are now circulating on their own. And, and I quote this passage because there's two points in it that I highlight in the essay. First, the connection between the exchange value of carbon credits and actual patches of exchange forest are difficult to substantiate, especially once they get bundled into other kinds of, of, of trading mechanisms. Next, the original value of these credits is not the conserved forest at all, but the environmental harm from which the value of the conserved forest is derived, right? So it's the harm that we're doing to the environment that produces all this value, which is paradoxical. As environmental harm is abundant these days, it is perhaps no surprise that offsetting and mitigation are prominent among the ecosystem services on offer today, as is seen in the rise of biodiversity and species banks and related trading mechanisms, like Sean Sullivan um, writes about. And um, in, in, in another point that um, James Fairhead um, and uh, Melissa Leach and Ian Schoons um, in a, in a uh, 2012 uh, editing collection on what they call green grabbing in the Journal of Peasant Studies, they suggest we're living in a global economy of repair in which the uh, downside of growth, which is environmental harm, is continuously offset by uh, repair in other countries, all of which creates all kinds of opportunities for investment. And Sean Sullivan responds to this by, um, by delineating this logic of repair, which I won't get into um, in any detail, but the article she does that is called After the Green Rush. And in, in all the detail of that, what the main point is, is that the idea um, that uh, repair of the environment is possible through investment depends on a number of problematic assumptions that have to do with um, basically assumptions about how exchange value works and the inevitability of the environmental harm that's being upset. So by the logic of these premises and principles, um, it becomes possible to calculate a net environmental gain. In other words, it becomes possible to argue, and I've actually seen people do this, that the Earth is better off as a result of residual harm, since it generated all kinds of green investment that improved the environment ultimately. Once people start talking like this, um, the strangeness of these ways of understanding nature becomes fairly self-evident. Um, because, of course, we know that um, qualitatively different ecosystems, qualitatively unique ecosystems, can't be exchanged for one another in this way. And we also know, of course, that harming a qualitatively unique ecosystem, no matter how many other ecosystems you protect, can't be fixed in this way. <laughs> And yet this is a fundamental assumption of, of, of all of this. So this is where we tend to slip over, I argue, into cultural common sense. We don't have these kinds of conversations, we have other kinds of um, com conversations, because cultural common sense um, is easier and um, more expedient. And so you get these sort of basic sorts of assertions which seem to make sense to a lot of people that people are motivated by money, that capitalist development is inevitable, and that someone has to pay for nature. Um, and what I argue in my book is that all of this common sense, which underpins the logic of these sorts of trading mechanisms, comes from an older and deeper uh, cultural legacy of what I call nature for contemplation. So I argue nature for contemplation, 
which is older, going back to at least the 19th, probably the 18th century, is the legacy, the cultural legacy of nature for speculation, which is newer, probably going back to the 1990s. Okay? So now thinking about this legacy of nature for contemplation, a long cherished value of modern culture is that most valuable things are things that cannot be exchanged. Indeed, we refer to these things as priceless, and nature has been prominent among the things that should never be bought or sold. This perspective has deep roots in the, conser in, in, the conser in the conservation movement, as exemplified by these words from Sierra Club founder John Weir. Quote, devotees of raging commercialism seem to have perfect contempt for nature, and instead of lifting their eyes to the god of the mountain, lift them to the almighty dollar. At first glance, it appears that current efforts to make nature exchangeable seek to invert this deep-rooted cultural value. And to be sure, there is some visible effort to convince people that treating nature as a priceless thing is a luxury that we can ill afford, as are many priceless things. My argument here, however, is the opposite, which is the creation of exchangeable nature actually depends on the kinds of priceless nature that Muir was defending in the passage above. To begin with, Muir was writing against the so-called wise use movement at the turn of the 20th century, and particularly the construction of a dam inside his beloved Yosemite, where he lived for much of his life. Exchangeable nature can be priced. Okay, so so to reiterate. Graham's point. So, 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 uh, so, so, Weir was struggling against what he perceived as as um, a kind of use value of nature that was harmful. But today, we're talking about an exchange value that is being generated, as Graham argues, precisely because nature is not used. Okay, this depends on abstractions related to money's exchange value. The nature Muir and his compatriots worshipped was also an abstraction, with elements of pro-exchangeability. There have continuously been significant points of compatibility between turning one's eyes up to the gods of the mountain, which is a universal nature as imagined by Muir and others, and to the almighty dollar, which is universal exchange value. So universal nature, universal exchange value. Elsewhere, I've synthesized key arguments from a rich body of scholarship on historical abstractions of nature and modern culture in relation to more recent formulations of exchangeable nature, and that's in my nature on book two. What follows are the key points of that synthesis. First, <clears throat> abstract nature revolves around idealized views, which we denizens of modernity readily recognize. So if you're driving along a scenic byway, if you stop at a scenic overview or watch any nature film, you will see these views over and over again and you'll find that they're readily familiar to you. These views are best appreciated from a detached distance, and so we turn our eyes up to them, or even better, we turn our eyes down at them because we want to have a commanding view of them. Environmental historian Glenn Cronin argues that seeing, literally, in this way, fosters a kind of awe-inspired detachment in relation to a specialized realm of nature that seems to exist beyond the unpleasant conditions of modern culture and capitalist value making. What this view conceals, however, is that modern culture and capitalist value making are the source of this awe-inspiring nature. The creation of conservancies and parks around the world over the past 300 years has accompanied and to a large extent been financed by capitalist expansion, which is something that Dan Brockington, Rosalind Duffy, and myself show in Nature Unbound. It has also consistently entailed forced removals of people from landscapes designated as nature. This last point is particularly important since it was by virtue of these forced removals and their systematic separation from contiguous spaces that nature parks could appear as places without people. Um, to quote and off, uh, that's a statement that Dan Brockington sort of coined in the film by the same title. So these are places without people and by extension places without history. This way of making parks 
blends nature, blends the nature they protect a kind of universal quality because it's not embedded in the history or the contiguous landscapes from which it's been abstracted. For early conservationists, in fact, this nature was nothing less than the basis, this is a quote from Anna Sin, the basis of universal truth available through direct experience and study. So these places are set aside, they're abstracted from their surrounding landscapes and the histories of those landscapes, and they become a portal to universal truth. So here we have the quality also definitive of the abstract models that I described in the previous section, right? A universal concept or rule that seems to apply everywhere, regardless of cultural and historical particularities. From this perspective, an individual park appears more as a window onto the universal, to quote saying again, than a particular place with a particular history in relation to surrounding places. Moreover, the possibility of one object, which is abstract nature, standing for an entire class of other objects, parks, is a prerequisite for exchangeability, right? So if we have this idea of a universal abstract nature that is present in all parks and makes them in some senses uh, exchangeable to each other, this is uh, remarkably similar to um, the uh, idea that money uh, renders all things exchangeable. Am I out of time? Can I uh, just finish? conservation, development, and energy within the context of neoliberal capitalism 
ecotourism, new media, and general social theory. In 2011, Brown received a prestigious NWO Winnie grant for research uh, project entitled Nature 2.0, The Political Economy of Conservation Online and South African Environments. He has published over 45 articles in peer-reviewed journals and edited volumes and is the author of Transforming the Frontier, Peace Parks and the Politics of Neoliberal Conservation in Southern Africa. Additionally, he serves as the editor of open access journal Conservation and Society and the book series Critical Green Engagements, investigating the green economy and its alternatives through the University of Arizona Press. Good. Um, thanks very much for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks especially to, to Bill, uh, Mike, Karen, and uh, Francis. I don't know if Francis is around here for organizing and for inviting me. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Mike keeps on making jokes, you know, asking me why I want to uh, step out of my comfort zone. But I think, you know, the, the nice thing about, you know, challenging yourself, or the good thing about challenging yourself intellectually is, is exactly that, stepping out of your comfort, you know, out of your comfort, uh, comfort zone and to, to meet new people. And I've, I've, I've really enjoyed the interaction so far, really enjoyed the presentations and the discussions. and. The, so I hope I can contribute a little bit. I'm not uh, in the same, working or writing in the same broad, I think, field that, that most of you are working in, but I hope at least I can uh, contribute a little bit to the discussions. Um, my paper is entitled uh, Environmental Conservation in Capitalist Times and the Natures of Value. And I think it, 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 it syncs very nicely with uh, what, what uh, Jim Igo has been talking about. Uh, Jim and I have been working a lot together, and uh, as he said, uh, we've written a couple of papers, uh, all entitled, uh, all entitled uh, Nature on the Move, so this is partly derived from that and taken further into some directions that I've been thinking about uh, as I got this invitation. Um, and, and so, uh, it starts with a couple of things that uh, Jim has also been, uh, been talking about, um, and basically uh, comes from sort of a long-standing interest in uh, uh, the commodification or uh, capitalization of environmental conservation. So Jim already mentioned this a couple of times. I've been, I've been fascinated sort of by the question: What happens when you know capitalism tries to commodify and tries to capitalize on you know the contradictions that it itself engenders? Right? I think many presentations, including Professor Northcott's presentation yesterday, very clearly showed that you know a big problem that we're, that we're having is or that capitalism has is that it engenders incredible social and environmental, negative environmental contradictions. And um, in trying to deal with this, um, they, 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 they seem to do that in the way that, you know, uh, neoclassical economists or capitalists normally do, by trying to make it part and parcel of the capitalist process itself. And an uh, archetypical example that, that Jim already mentioned is this team. Uh, the ecosystems of uh, uh, there's some sound going on here. I hope it's not too. Uh, <clears throat> the ecosystems of the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. I don't know. Has anybody heard of this initiative led by this gentleman over there, Pavan Sukdev, uh, who, as, as Jim said, you know, is just the most well-placed individual to save us and to 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 do conservation because he was a you know a chief executive at Deutsche Bank. Um, and increasingly you see that the, the, the executives in the conservation world come straight from Wall Street. So the, the chief executive of uh, the Nature Conservancy, somebody also worked on the, in, in, uh, at Wall Street in, in New York. And their main issue is exactly this, uh, that Jim also talked about, that nature, nature's values have been invisible. Right? So it literally it says, the invisibility of biodiversity values has often encouraged inefficient use or even destruction of the natural capital that's the foundation of our economies. And so the whole idea that is that we must make nature's values visible. Another example um, that perhaps is more well known to all of us is the, the green economy, uh, launched in 2009 uh, during the financial crisis. And a big report uh, later came out in 2011 uh, by the United Nations Environment Programme where they talk about the misallocation of capital, right? And they say that 
the causes of these crises, the, 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 the triple crises, the financial crisis, environmental crisis, and the developmental crisis, uh, vary, but at a fundamental level, this is what they argue in the report, they share a common feature, namely the gross misallocation of capital. During the last two decades, much capital was poured into property, fossil fuels, and structured financial assets uh, with embedded derivatives, but relatively little in comparison was invested um, in renewable energy, energy efficiency, public transportation, sustainable agriculture, ecosystem and biodiversity protection, and land and water conservation. So their whole idea is that we must shift our investments from you know, dirty kind of investments into more renewable investments and have a different idea about where to, uh, where to place the capital that we have at hand. But obviously this, 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 this begs a big question, and this is sort of the question that I want to sort of like answer in the, in the presentation. Uh, the question of what will actually happen when we try to make nature valuable according to these contemporary ideas of value, and what happens when we turn nature into natural capital. Um, so when Mr. Pavel Sukhdev has you know, all dollar signs in his eyes, and he thinks that that's exactly the same as fishes and trees, you know, what does that, what does that come, come to? What kind of conservation or idea about conserving a national environment does that lead to? And I think there are a couple of core questions that we need to answer uh, in order to get there, and those will structure my presentation. Um, and they seem very basic, but, uh, but for me they're absolutely crucial. First of all, what do we mean by capital and what's, what is natural capital? For me this is absolutely foundational, and in many analyses people tend to kind of skip over it, and uh, on purpose I've tried to, I, th I thought, let me, let me just put it in there, because for me this, this is absolutely sort of the fundamental uh, sort of assumption on which I base uh, many of my uh, theoretical work. And secondly, what do we mean with value and exactly whose values are these? And then thirdly, to what kind of natures and ideas of conservation does this lead? So I will discuss these in turn. And importantly, uh, I mean, you, you can clearly see that Jim and I have been uh, having this ongoing conversation for a long time. Um, but for me, very importantly in all of that is that valuing natural capital or, or valuing nature under capitalism it does not mean that nature, of course, has no value before. I think uh, uh, Professor Katongle yesterday really pointed this out uh, very well right, in, 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 in his talk. Right? There are very different ideas about how his, how his uh, father and mother dealt with, with, with nature and agriculture uh, uh, around them. And that in school they were taught something quite different that was very far removed from that. Um, so it really means that value shifts from one value system to another. I think that's actually crucial to keep in mind. So, the first question, what is capital? And uh, this seems, for many, a very straightforward uh, kind, of, kind of question. Um, but what many people do is that they, they, they define capital as a thing or a resource. So natural capital is pieces of nature that have some value, that have some worth. Um, human capital are people that have some sort of worth or some sort of value, and financial capital, you know, same thing. Um, but I, I go back to sort of Marx's definition later on, further uh, developed by David Harvey, that it is about money in process or value in process. And for me, that, that, that's an absolutely crucial difference. Right? So it's not a thing for me, or not only a thing, or a resource, but it is, it is a dynamic. It is, is something that necessarily has to, has to move. And hence, that for me is what drives our current system of capitalism. So capital and capitalism, of course, are not the same thing. And I, I keep on going back to the definition of capital in, it, in that sense. Um, from this definition of capital comes a central imperative of capitalism, namely, as Neil Smith uh, wrote, uh, to reduce the time and cost of circulation so that capital can be returned more quickly to the sphere of production and accumulation can proceed more rapidly. So if you have a certain stockpile of resources that is valuable, that has a particular worth, in this definition it actually only becomes capital when it somehow is implicated in this dynamic process, in this process of moving things around. So you can have a whole uh, a warehouse full of, 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 of valuable goods, but it only becomes capital when somehow or another it is invested in or brought into broader structures 
of this, this kind of circulation that Neil Smith is talking about here. So through con contracts that will, you know, that, 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 uh, that, that you know, uh, tell people that, that, that um, uh, make it mandatory to sell these things at a certain point in time in the future, uh, etc. So that there, there's an idea that it has to get uh, into this process on the move. Um, and obviously for me that's also where, you know, the continuous emphases on economic growth, profit and accumulation come from. Right? It was what politicians the second every second sentence that they utter, you know, contains the uh, terms of economic growth uh, and all of that. And that's very logical when capital is money in process and value in process. So I think that is very that is fairly uh, standard for most people, but for me, it's, you know, I, I just laid it out because it's, it's very fundamental to my to my argument. So natural capital, I don't know whether you can see it properly through the lights but at the bottom there, is really then not just about a stock of nature that is worth something, but about subjecting nature to value in process. It's about seeing nature differently so that it becomes part of this dynamic. And that's why we termed our papers that Jim already referred to as nature on the move. So, value. What is value? Obviously, many kind of definitions, but for me, the most important thing is uh, in this presentation, it's not sort of the intrinsic worth of something, but the assigned worth of something. And hence, uh, it's a political economic process, and hence we need to understand this political economic process, and particularly the system that dominates it, in order to understand what happens with value in contemporary times. So, for me, this is neoliberal capitalism after the financial crisis. And um, uh, Professor Northcott uh, talked about uh, corporate capitalism yesterday, uh, obviously, and all kinds of actors that are really important in that process. Here, I want to emphasize a couple of other core features that really determine ideas about capitalist valuation uh, in the 21st century. And these, are, these include, uh, it's not an exhaustive list, but these include financialization and derivatives, the dominance of credit and fictitious capital, as Tim also mentioned, and flexible co-production, uh, 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 what is also called in the literature increasingly prosumption, this pro presumption in production and consumption at the same time, uh, etc. But the, the key point for me is this idea about fictitious capital. Uh, David Harvey uh, defined fictitious capital as capital put into motion, capital put into circulation without any material base. So it's money usually, or other types of resources, put into circulation that later on will have to sort of repay themselves back through particular investments into material goods and services, uh, etc., etc. So this is, of course, where ideas about financialization, derivatives, particularly the dominance of credit comes from. Obviously, I don't have to tell in this country that we live in a credit-dominated uh, economy, right? And the key thing for me is this incredible sort of future orientation in all of this. So it's all the, the, the whole idea about this and, and, and what is so important for valuation is that you sort of like mortgage the future, right? So if you have a particular kind of credit system, or you, you, you lend out credit to somebody, and in the, in the future somebody of course has to pay this back. Of derivatives are contracts about something that will be produced in the future and that have a certain, you know, speculative value attached to them. So uh, just very, very simply, right? You know, if Mike and I, uh, Mike is a great potato grower, and if uh, I, I, I ask Mike to sell me, you know, a bag of potatoes in ten years' time, and I will think it's about worth ten, ten dollars, he can sell our contract further to, to, to Bill and say, and Bill can speculate that it's actually worth twelve dollars. So he makes a, a little handsome profit, you know, of two dollars in ten years' time when we actually come through on our, on our derivative deal. But obviously, Bill can send it on to somebody else who doesn't know us and uh, you know, the fact that you know Mike is actually not a fantastic potato grower. I heard that yesterday. Um, and um, you know, actually, the bag might be worth only seven dollars, and so the speculation that it might actually be worth more than what Bill thinks it's worth, maybe fourteen, fifteen dollars, might actually not be true. And so you build a whole you know edifice, and we all know this from the financial crisis, and I will come back to that just now. Um, so in this process, for me, ideas about value become sort of ephemeral value, right? Based not on material commodities alone, but really on uh, immaterial commodities. And this I got really from uh, Tony uh, Negri and Antonio uh, Michael Hart in their books on empire and multitude. 
You know, things like expertise, financial constructs, meaning giving, brands, etc. Those are the things that increasingly determine value and that can determine the capitalist value if you work in this future-oriented derivative kind of value system. So I got a couple of examples to make that absolutely clear. I don't think I have to explain much because these things, you know, we've lived through all of them, particularly here in the US. Um, subprime mortgages, uh, very simple, you know, people thought, yeah, I thought we were just buying a house, but on top of that material house, all kinds of other derivative assets are being built. Um, derivatives have turned out to be, you know, a little bit different from what many people thought that they were. Um, unfortunately, Wall Street still thinks that they can uh, tame them and keep them under control. So obviously, it's a complete fallacy. This relates to myself uh, and to probably a lot of us uh, as well. But let me let me just, you know, refer to myself here. That uh, you know, our type of expertise brings all kinds of values that are ephemeral. That doesn't, you know, just you know, for whatever people are willing to give uh, or give whatever the, uh, for it. Um, but yeah, you put the doctor in, some, in front of somebody's name and somebody sounds convincing, etc. Something becomes a lot uh, worth a lot more. Uh, whether it's necessarily true or not, I mean, if you work in development, you know that you know, half of all development aid workers in the world, you know, play this game very well and have no clue about what actually they're doing. And that's actually what they say out loud. Out loud. But I think if you want to really press the point home, I might refer to my good friend here. Many of you may know him. Um, Drinking a nice cup of coffee, uh, Nespresso here. So, Nespresso has a particular type of value because this gentleman drinks it. But if I would drink it and be on that picture, it wouldn't be worth very much, obviously. I think you know, that gets to the whole core for me about the idea about ephemeral value, right? Somewhat, because he's famous, somehow this translates into an idea about value that direct, and so it doesn't really have to do with the material cup of coffee anymore. Uh, I don't like espresso, Nespresso much, uh, but anyway, that's another point, right? So ephemeral values. So the next question was, what actually happens then when nature becomes natural capital? For me, there are two important points. I mean, I just show these books to, get that, to show that you know there's a lot of work. And Jim was also saying there's a lot of work going into this. A lot of uh, bankers, businesses, but also governments, uh, agent, uh, UN agencies are you know, investing a lot of money trying to understand what kind of uh, natu what natural capital means, how we can evaluate natural capital. And it's not that simple. Um, because what you need to do is first you know, to assign quantitatively comparable values to qualitatively incommensurable conditions and relationships. And again, these incommensurable conditions and relationships happen over time, right? Of course, we all know ecosystems um, I mean, the, the ecosystem the definition of ecosystem obviously is that you know everything hangs together with everything else. And how do you translate you know a piece of that into value when the value of a particular you know part of the ecosystem is always related to all the other little pieces of the puzzle? You know, and that actually these change over time. So not only do we have to quantify comparable values uh, or quantify incommensurable conditions and relationships right now in the present, but you also have to sort of calculate how these will change into the future as ecosystems progress, as, the, as they interact dynamically over time. Um, I would argue, together with a guy called uh, Burkett, that this is not, a, not just problematic, but inherently anti-ecological uh, for five reasons. Uh, first, that unlike money, nature cannot be disaggregated into discrete and homogeneous uh, value units. It's always, by definition, an estimation. Perhaps the estimation is better sometimes than other times. But to get an exact, discrete, and homogeneous, homogeneous value unit obviously doesn't, it doesn't work in nature. Secondly, the reliance on money leads to uh, what he, uh, what he uh, argues an inadequate accounting for the irreversible character of uh, many natural processes. So the idea that you know, the price will go up um, or that value will change as you know a, a certain type of degradation has become irreversible, you know doesn't hold, right? It might be too late by then. Something, a certain form of de degradation might already be going too far, you know. So by the time that the price goes up, 
it might already be too late. <clears throat> Third, uh, monetization involves an absolute tension between money's quantitative limitlessness and the limits to natural wealth of any given material quali uh, uh, qualities. So obviously, on your bank account, you can always, I mean, we can't, obviously, uh, ourselves, but in principle, you can always add more zeros uh, and so increase your money stockpile into all eternity. Right? We can always print more money. There's no uh, quantitative limitless to, to money in the world. But obviously, you know, the more money that we print doesn't mean that we can substitute that for more natural capital. Because, you know, the natural capital allowing is, is, is inevitably has particular limits. I think this also comes back to, I think, what, what Peter was talking about yesterday, this idea that these different types of capitals can sub somehow substitute for each other. First of all, that has the idea behind it that they are things and resources, not dynamic processes, as I've uh, defined them. But secondly, also that you, that you can keep on converting the one for the other. Right? We can all become infinitely more richer into the future, but it doesn't mean that as we become richer, we can all translate our money into natural wealth, into all eternity. There's simply not enough nature or earth to go around. Fourthly, the price of a resource stock uh, is determined not just by the absolute size of the resource stock, but by many other aspects of how markets work. Right? So meaning that price may not rise as depletion occurs. And it, this, this sounds like the second one, uh, second argument, but the difference is here that um, markets don't work according to the sort of rational ideas that many new classical economists have about markets. Right? Um, so certain market brokers May have may, may benefit from uh, uh, marketing or putting a sort of picture of this market that makes it seem abundant or that makes certain things seem abundant or more attractive for people to buy, which doesn't you know obviously Nike and all these organizations do exactly the same, uh, as does uh, I think Professor Northcott's uh, friend that he talked about yesterday, right? That, that, that these products are fantastic, are great if you wear Nike, then you're cooler than if you don't wear Nike. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the material uh, resource. And markets, of course, work not just according to technical demand and supply price signals, but, you know, involve huckstering, involve uh, all kinds of lies, involve public, uh, you know, marketing, commercials, etc., etc., etc. And so these will not necessarily change as we see a change in the natural resource underlying these markets. And fifthly, Higher resource prices may actually accelerate the resources, uh, resources depletion. So as you know, the price of resources go up, you know, it might actually stir more investment in making, in extracting them, or you know, in cheaper type of extraction mechanisms. So actually, I mean, this is a very dangerous game to play, uh, obviously, and can be captured, uh, I think, in this nice uh, little cartoon that I often show to my students. That this is what we will end up with if we uh, go for the idea of natural capital. We will be left with a couple of species and then others will have to be dismissed. The second point, what happens when nature becomes natural capital, is that, and this is uh, crucially what Jim also talks, uh, talked about, is that material natures, on the one hand, need to be refashioned or reconceptualized such that they enable the circulation of ephemeral values. Right? So this comes back to what I when I started sort of explaining about the kind of value system that we're in today that really puts the emphasis on ephemeral values. So you need to find ways to move this monetary value, this ephemeral value of nature, while actually leaving nature in debt, while conserving nature in situ. And, you know, so this is about the, the, you know, the commodification of the non-use of nature. And this is also where we're going to do a fight with, 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 with a lot of more dogmatic Marxists. Because obviously for them, that, that's absolutely impossible, right? The production of anything includes, and this is what Marx himself said in the great footnote in Capital, includes you know, the transformation of nature. You know, there cannot be a different way to produce anything. And, and yet, what we see now is exactly the opposite, is that we see the production of the non-use of nature, the production and the commodification of the non-use of nature. So how do you do that? Um, first of all, you must make these kind of markets liquid. Um, liquidity is, is, is a business term for you know a market that has an ever ready supply uh, uh, supply of sellers and buyers, 
whereby things can move quickly. So if you want to sell your car, obviously it's very easy because there's always a lot of people looking for cars and there's always a lot of cars being sold. So it's a very liquid market. But there's a problem here uh, with natural resources because environmental services right, and their liquidity are circumscribed in time and space because you're talking about in situ nature here. You're talking about material natures here. So one of the things that they've tried to do is this whole idea about payments for ecosystem services. I don't know if everybody heard of this. It's basically that, you know, the, the quintessential example is that if, if some communities live on top of a mountain, next to a water stream, stream and down, downstream, there's a floral company, they depend on clean water, they will pay the communities not to, um, you know, not to uh, pollute the water so that they will benefit from clean water. Now, obviously, this is a very limited market. In fact, it's not really a market at all. It is like a, it's a compensation scheme. So, but this this idea of environmental services has become very dominant, and, and of course, it's much more marketable than all these uh, sort of biodiversity derivative ideas that, that that we see floating around these days. Um, people sort of kind of understand that you pay for the services that nature that nature gives us, but obviously, these these, these services are still dependent on these material natures in situ, in, part in, in particular spaces and times. And so what we've seen is you know, a huge rush to go beyond payments for ecosystem services, because these are not liquid enough into all kinds of more derivative structures. Biodiversity derivatives, uh, ecosystem enhancement uh, uh, derivatives, uh, etc., etc. Wetland credits here in the US is a big market. So you see this, and this has been going on for quite a while, but it's, it's taking off quite, uh, quite dramatically right now. Um, and so the tools that got us into the financial crisis are now the tools that are supposed to save nature for us. And if you want to get a little bit more into this, you can go to the website ecosystemmarketplace.com um, to, uh, I don't know if you can see, but they have all kinds of markets and market structures for biodiversity, for water, for species, etc. And, um, and hence, uh, this is where they really do that, uh, do that game. So what do we end up? In this process, uh, my argument is that we emerge, we come out with uh, what I call a fictitious conservation. Right? So, based on this fundamental contradiction in the link between material environments and these monetized services, we see that people working for these ecosystem marketplace and others, you know, need to sort of standardize the stigmages and utterly abstract them in order to be exchangeable, leading to a profound new face of nature. So. I present to you nature in the 21st century. This is really what it looks like uh, increasingly. Right? And this process of extraction is, is what, what, what Jim Igo talked about in much more depth in, in, in his presentation. Now, obviously, this creates you know, systemic speculation, risks, and the ultimate separation of nature from the material and social conditions uh, that produce them. And the fact is that that is exactly the point. Right, the whole point is to try to separate nature from the material social conditions that produce these natures in order to come to an idea that we can save nature by selling it. And this is what I call fictitious conservation. Literally fictitious because it's conservation based not no longer in material natures. It is nature, you know, that is sort of ephemeral. Alright, so where does it lead us in terms of, you know, ideas about value and then I'll start rounding up. Now, as I said, capitalist conservation is based on this idea about fictitious value, right? A nature based not in actual material natures. Um, and so, for me, it's really important, and I've only started to do that more recently. And it's also an invitation, I think, to, to to all of you, that we need to sort of really rethink the natures of value, away from these type of capitalist forms of valuation, right? To and to do that radically, and I mean radical in the way that, 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 that Jim talks about it, by going back to the roots, right? to re-root value into the materiality of natures, re-root value in the spirit, spirituality of material natures, and to re-root values of nature in people and democracy and democratic forms of, of, of governance, not just labor as, as Marx would have it. Um, so my question is, is there a role for the Catholic Church and other religious institutions in this? And I think there absolutely is. But for me it's absolutely crucial that they sort of move forward in, you know, taking the, this uh, stuff into account. So where to go from here, from here? These are just some wild things that I've just been thinking about, just not to leave it at, at, at a pretty uh, depressing uh, analysis, I would guess. 
Obviously, for me, it's important to focus on the systemic features, you know, to really confront this abstract logic behind the ecological crisis that we're in. And in that sense, I think the most realistic kind of way out of this is a, is a two-step strategy. And I think on the one hand, uh, Professor Northup and I talked about this yesterday, you need to sort of like change contemporary capitalist pr practices and really try to subvert the logic in a certain way to try to green kind of production processes, but also go a little bit a step further, you know, to tax CO2, financial transactions, also diffuse competitive pressures, slow down trade, all things that are already, of course, completely out, you know, outrageous for, for contemporary governments to talk about. But I think that, that is only the, the short term that, that we really need to start doing, while at the same time looking at the medium to longer term to sort of really conceptualize and building on alternative economic spaces based on capital as value and process and economic growth, but on the quality and democratic values rooted in people and nature. Now the question is how to translate that into a politics of value, and I won't have time to, to go into that here, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Our last speaker today, um, and then there will be a brief exchange between the speakers, and then finally some time for your questions, is Michael Buddy. Michael Buddy currently serves as Chair and Professor of Catholic Studies, Professor of Political Science, and Senior Research Professor at the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University. Previously, he served as Chair of the Department of Politi uh, Political Science and Director of the Center for the Church State Studies. His areas of research focus on interaction between ecclesiology, political economy, and culture. Among his books are The Borders of Baptism, Identities, Allegiances, and the Church, and the co-edited Witness of the Body, The Past, Present, and Future of Christian Martyrdom. He's also written The Two Churches, Catholicism and Capitalism in the World System, The Magic Kingdom of God, Christianity, and Global Cultures, uh, culture Industries, and Christianity Incorporated. In addition, he has edited several other books and published scholarly articles, including published in scholarly journals, including Studies in Christian Ethics, Sociology of Religion, and World Policy Journal. As you will notice, there is a regression in technology from starting with an online conversation to a PowerPoint presentation to me. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you and have you with us today. Um, just a word of background to what I want to speak about with you this afternoon. Prior to joining the Department of Catholic Studies here at DePaul in 2000, I spent 20 years in departments of political science, both here at a Catholic institution and also at a large state university with strengths in agribusiness, science, and technology. In both, my work focused on political economy, especially on matters of global economics and development theory. My interest in environmental issues, development, and political economy date back to my undergraduate years, way back in the 1970s, when I first encountered important figures like Nicholas Georgeski Rogan, William Ophuls, and the pre-World Bank, pre-processed theology work of Herman Daly. All of which is to say that for me, thinking about ecology and theology always presupposes some understanding, or at least some decisions, about the political economy of capitalism in general, in the post-war field of development theory in particular. Let me start with a few statements that I will assume rather than argue for in this paper and conversation. I lack the time, and God knows you can't be expected to have the patience required to go through any of this in detail. Um, I invite you to, re to, to consider these uh, remarks as a modest proposal rather than a, a full-blown uh, exploration or argumentation. Um, a couple of a couple of things uh, to offer up for consideration. First of all, development is among the most contested terms in the Western lexicon, and it cannot be understood adequately unless one accepts that development is a violent, coercive process. Always has been, always will be. It involves the coerced reorganizations of societies, peoples, lands, and practices. Sometimes that coercion is obvious in the form of soldiers or police or private violence that pushes people off their land or prohibits them access to needed resources of food and materials or kills people who disagree with them regarding the ends and means behind the development process. In other times and places, the coercion is less, is less easily perceived, taking forms ranging from changes in tax structures designed to push people from self-provisioning activities into those dependent on wage markets, 
to legal processes that replace traditional land tenure systems with those that benefit the favored agents and outcomes of developed processes. Moreover, the violence is not an originating practice that's, that, once its grim work is finished, can be replaced by a more civilized sort of cooperative or voluntary set of, of understandings. This doesn't end with the so-called primitive accumulation stage of economic transformation, but in fact is a necessary and ongoing function throughout. Secondly, development has and continues to be an unrelenting war on the ability of peoples to provide for their most basic needs food, water, shelter, and more. It has been called the war on subsistence. And this 500-year battle continues to push people further into depending for their survival on labor markets they do not control, investment policies they do not control, and ideological systems they do not control. All of which presupposes the intrinsic inferiority of subsistence activities relative to market modern relations in terms of efficiency, productivity, and freedom. However much they disagree on other things, the need to destroy subsistence systems made allies of liberal capitalists and authoritarian state socialists, investment bankers, and most well-intentioned nonprofit organizations throughout much of the modern era. As Adam Smith knew but refused to say, that was left to his contemporary Sir James Stewart to say it explicitly, people first had to be made desperate by the destruction of subsistence activities before they would voluntarily agree to sell their labor power to the wealthy on whatever terms they could manage. Third observation, development is tied to a conception of state government, governance, that regardless of regime type, liberal, authoritarian, electoral, whatever the regime type, development assumes that in principle economic expansion is without limit. Indeed, I would suggest it's no exaggeration to say that the assumption of unlimited economic expansion is among the essential material underpinnings of political liberalism, explicitly so in the work of John Locke, as was mentioned yesterday, and his labor theory of value, and simply assumed by generations to follow. One point about Locke that builds upon our conversation yesterday, for, for, for Locke's ideas about property and freedom to work, the right to extract from nature and make private property presupposed, as Locke said, quote, that there is enough and is good left over in nature's bounty for everyone else to do the same. The promise of liberal democracy in general and of development as the name of a package of interventions designed to broaden and deepen liberal economic relations and spaces needs the promise of economic, and, excuse me, needs the promise of unrestricted growth just as a fire needs oxygen. This is so, I would suggest, because the expansion of goods and services promised by development allowed politics to focus on the allocation of future resources, of pieces of a pie growing ever larger, to borrow that tired economics metaphor, this rather than the politics of redistributing existing wealth and access to resources. The politics of redistribution are, and always have been, politics of the most brutal sort. For those on the bottom to gain, those on the top have to lose. Those at the top do not surrender their privileges lightly, and the resulting zero-sum politics has no room for the niceties of civil liberties, meaningful democratic processes, or presumptions of political legitimacy that make for some social peace or some social quiescence. This is not news. C.B. McPherson described as economy and elegance how processes of political participation, for example, voting and office holding, in Great Britain were not expanded beyond the property classes until those processes were structured and limited in ways that made wealth redistribution impossible at a later date. More than 30 years ago, Alan Wolf explained how the underlying politics of Western democracies was built upon a shared and violent agreement on economic growth as the end, the teleology, the telos of politics. Parties, factions, and movements disagreed on means to that end, but the end was shared. Regimes that could not deliver economic growth were dismissed or overthrown, and even authoritarian regimes built legitimacy on their ability to deliver the goods, even or especially without the promise of political freedom. The specter of redistributive politics, ugly, uncompromising, and unrelenting, has been the wolf at the door that kept this chimera of economic expansion as the good beyond all goods, no matter how improbable or costly that good might re reveal itself to be over the years. When Pope Paul VI described economic development as, quote, the new name for peace in Progressio Popolorum in 1967, 
He was right in ways he may not have understood fully, even as he bequeathed to the church a powerful slogan that continues to make it difficult to, for us to see that development may also be a new name for warfare. Another point, development as practiced and understood has put the ecosystem in a, into a long-term spiral that has already inflicted irreparable harm and has already generated significant suffering on people worldwide. We've talked about that at length this weekend, especially the poor and others incapable of protecting themselves from damage done to soil, water, air, and other systems of the biosphere. Things will get worse in ways both foreseen and unforeseen. Political and economic elites, in my view, are not up to the task of addressing or fixing the problem. There is no technological fix capable of undoing what has been done, and politics will grow more authoritarian and coercive regardless of purported ideologies and political beliefs. From the left, center, and right come calls and alarms for protection of natural resources and systems, of property and security, of ways of life and assurances for the future that require systems of surveillance, discipline, violence, and interventions both hard and soft. I, re I would reject that this reflects an undue pessimism or the projection of an otherwise gloomy personality. That might be me. Uh, indeed, people with sunnier dispositions than me have reached the same conclusions, which are not limited to the nihilistic or the apocalyptically inclined among us. Of course, all of this is confounded by the conceptual and ideological incoherence of the term development itself. It admits of so many definitions. It has gone so many reforms and permutations and adjustments over the past 70 years that to define it is to privilege an array of claims in advance. In fact, the sheer resilience of the term, the ability of its believers to redefine it and recast it in the face of criticism, to deflect such criticism away from core convictions, uh, is itself an important part of the story. What is inadequate or what is manifested might be outdated notions of development or incomplete notions of development or not the newest and most improved versions. Such deflections and offloading serve to keep development's essentials immune from criticism even as it absorbs and co-ops much of its opposition. All of which is to say that I am aware of the ambiguity surrounding the term and that the ambiguity itself is part of the ideological and political power of the discursive world of development. It remains simultaneously ethereal and profoundly material. It's hard to pin down as smoke, and yet seemingly as obviously good as the air itself. Um, I want to talk for a bit about what it might mean to begin to free the church from the notion of development. Separating the good work of the church and Christians worldwide from the development industry or the development machine, for lack of a better term, in some ways presents itself as similar to trying to free a host organism from a malicious parasite. The Christian works of mercy, church efforts for justice and peace, laudable initiatives to address poverty and immiseration, solidarity among churches and mutual assistance, all of these and more have become so intertwined with the institutional, conceptual, and ideological apparatuses of development that it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to envision them except in a context framed by development discourse. The separation must be made, however, especially if the church is serious about its commitments to the poor and to those today and tomorrow who will be made worse off by the workings of capital development in the context of ideological crisis. In fact, the language of crisis as future is itself an ideological apparatus of some comfort to the wealthy nations of the world, inasmuch as ecologically derived suffering has been part of the day-to-day -day reality of untold numbers of people worldwide for quite some time. If one restricts oneself to the genre known as Catholic social teaching, that is the formally promulgated body of ideas and declarations on Christianity and social issues in the recent past, the convention is from 1891 to the present, one finds a discourse on politics, economics, and church sharing some long-term continuities. Some of the strengths and manifest virtues of this tradition have already been explored, and I'm sure we'll continue to, to, to engage them in what remains of our time together. Um, in, the, in the matter that, that, that concerns us here, um, some other observations might be worth entering into the conversation regarding this, regarding church's reflections on social issues, social concerns, and by extension into future ecological conversations. One of these is that this genre has an overemphasis, I would suggest, on the autonomy of individual decision makers relative to the 
limits and barriers on decision making presented by structural institutions and processes. It also presupposes a consensus model of social organization in which conflicts like class and other deep cleavages are ignored or minimized whenever possible. In much of this literature, there are no intractable conflicts, no deep and unavoidable incompatibilities between one group and another. All differences can be solved by rich and poor, strong and weak, coming together in harmonious social engagement. There is a methodological and epistemological strategy in the sense that while most of the documents in the genre contain explicitly Christian justifications and theological reflections, the heavy work of analyzing and recommending matters of public life is left to natural law philosophy and related approaches available presumably to all persons with or without Christian conviction or formation. Using reason and human intelligence, people of any, all, and no faith can and should converge in the pursuit of the common good, itself a term of broad applicability that is thought to be readily apparent to persons of goodwill regardless of material circumstances, ideological formation, epistemological presuppositions, or any other contextual factors. A circumstance in which all of these choices taken together all too often result all too often result in social analyses that seem disconnected from the more radical implications of the theological material that undergirds them. In approaches to politics that charitably might be described as civics book or utopian in style, and most important for our immediate purposes, a, a consistent unwillingness to contemplate any sort of structural analysis of capitalism or of political economy, of the effects of investment on political agency and its limits, or anything similar. What you get, as typified in what I believe is probably the worst papal encyclical of my lifetime on these matters, is Centesimus Annus in 1991, which provides a wish list approach to Christian ethics. Simply make a list of all the good things you want from capitalism, wealth, material advancement, increased liberty, prosperity, and then make a second list of the bad things you don't want, inequality, poverty, exploitation, and plunder and tell the politicians and tell the business elites to give you one without the other. The document reflects no sense of linked dynamics, that one, for example, may not be able to avoid inequality and exploitation in the generation of wealth. No sense that might, one might be asking for things that are impossible to achieve simultaneously. No sense that you cannot perhaps order a la carte from the menu, menu of capitalism any more than you can order a la carte from the menu of aging or finitude. I would like the wisdom of old age without the pain of experience. I would like a toned physique without having to exercise. I would like the goodies of capitalism without any of the political, economic, or, or ecological bad things. I would also like a pony, or at least I wanted one when I was a kid. Uh, around the world, the church has developed, a, I would suggest, a substantial stake in development theory and practice both in its discourses and ideological legitimacy, and of course in its material practices and social, social ministries. And in, in this, the church has usually followed, rather than led, critiques and reappraisals in the intersections that define development. When secular scholars and activists in the 1960s, for example, attacked the notion of development simply as GNP growth, the church responded with the language of integral development. More recently, as the world's attention has shifted to grasp the enormity and interconnectedness of environmental crisis, Cardinal Turkson provides us with the language of integral ecology. In speaking of the buzzwords of development theory, terms like participation, empowerment, and poverty reduction, Andrea Cornwall and Karen Brock describe an intellectual apparatus that might also be said to describe Catholic social theory on matters of development, power, and conflict. As they write, quote, Many of the familiar terms of recent years evoke a comforting mutuality, a warm and reassuring consensus ringing with the satisfaction of everyone pulling together to pursue a common goal, a set of common goals for the well-being of all. Participation, poverty reduction, and empowerment epitomize this feel-good character. They connote warm and nice things, conferring on their users that goodness and rightness that development agencies need to assert their legitimacy to intervene in the lives of others. As they know, many of these terms, which, quote, once spoke of politics and power, end quote, have instead, quote, come to be reconfigured in the service of today's one-size-fits-all development recipes, spun into an apoliticized form that everyone can agree with. 
As such, their use in development policy may offer a little hope of the world free of poverty that they are used to evoke. All of this is important, I would suggest, because the era of development, however much it has benefited people like me, however many its blessings, has been built upon massive levels of, to use a genteel word, might be borrowing. We have borrowed from the lands and resources of indigenous peoples and the poor, from the minerals and soils of persons abroad, from the life support systems needed by future generations, and from the non-human sectors of creation. The buzzwords of the present day, sustainable development, integral development, local and participatory development, seem on balance to be fresher fig leaves on the extractive and coercive practices of capitalism in which the adjectives, sustainable, integral, local, provide ideological cover for the same old things that have created the world we inhabit today. Doubtless such is far from the intent of many, if not most people, committed to such modified, tamed, or governed versions of development. But nevertheless, these intents are having and will continue to have little to no power to transform the institutional and ideological power of the development machine. As an illustration, consider that Jeffrey Sachs, the prime mover of shock treatment economic policy that destroyed Bolivia, Russia, Poland, and other places in the 1980s and 90s, is considered to be a visionary in the field of sustainable development and that his massive new tome, The Age of Sustainable Development, will likely become required reading in academic centers for years to come. That no one laughs out loud about this testifies to the absurdity of the kind of the power of development discourse to swallow, disarm, and redeploy criticisms that leave it stronger for the effort. So I would suggest that the church is in need of a divorce, or at least an annulment, from these, from these concepts and practices if the integrity of the gospel and the well-being of the poor are to be carried into the future. Still, one, one shouldn't be too cynical regarding the church's internalization of development ideology. Um, it's, there's no question to me that for most people in the church, it has, it has represented the best, most efficacious way to live out the church's imperative to feed the hungry, house the homeless, house the homeless and cure for the sick. Um, talk more about that later if you want. Furthermore, I think part of the reason the church finds itself painted into a corner on development is a result of its legitimate desire to protect the poor and weak from the neo-Malthusianism of many of the world's powerful actors past and present. From the population bomb to lifeboat ethics and more, the church looked for ways out of resource traps and shortages by focusing on human ingenuity, the capacity of science to generate more from less, and the plenitude of creation already available. Uh, such was also accompanied by entreaties for the rich countries to share more equ equitably by some modest forms of redistribution. Responses to these range from deafening silence to shrill denunciations, which made the emphasis on existing and future plenitude more palatable and less controversial politically cult and, and culturally. Some of this was also motivated, no doubt, by a misplaced concern to protect Catholic scriptures on contraception. Still, one can discern a critical awareness of how environmentalism, conservation, and the like could become weapons of the strong against the weak, legitimating authoritarian violence, both overt and genteel, in the name of necessity and survival, even as the wheels of development grind on. We don't have a lot of time left, but if one were to start thinking about what it might mean to be church in the period after development, um, a couple of things might be might be useful starting points, um, perhaps not. I'm aware that being opposed to the idea of development seems to be many to be such a stupid idea as to be beneath exploration, akin to being against a self-evident good like mom or apple pie. Um, to some, reflections like these will be heard as just another comfortable white man seeking to deny others the privileges he already enjoys, sacrificing the poor and weak on the altar of language games and semantics, perhaps counseling the retreat of the church from the messy world of poverty and human suffering towards something more insulated, more abstract, or perhaps a self-fulfilling pessimism that ignores the reality of human ingenuity and resiliency and the ongoing generosity of God. Respectfully, I would resist those sorts of dismissive assertions, but I'm also aware that it would be presumptuous of me to, to dispel them too vigorously if such required me to tell the church and other parts of the world facing difficult choices and trade-offs that are simultaneously unique and widespread, what in fact should be done. More modestly, but perhaps more helpfully, might be a few points to consider as we think through how to love our neighbors and, and the created order in an era after development. 
Christians work to feed the hungry, house the homeless, and clothe the naked to bring justice to the world, after all, well before development. Presumably it will still be possible and necessary to do so after development crashes on the rocks of ecological limits and social breakdown. Fortunately for me, I'm not alone in asking the questions about the ongoing utility of the, of, of the category for the church, especially in poorer countries. I'll skip over some of these examples. They're, they're really, some of them are really quite inspiring and, and su 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 suggestive of, of, of ways forward in many ways. One, I, just, just as one piece of those, um, one expression of this willingness of church leaders to start moving into a world after development was one that I witnessed last year as one of the few external participants in a study group in East Africa, among East African church leaders, Protestant and Catholic, who were drawn together in a seminar focused on questions of land, land tenure, land use, matters of ecology and development, and so on, subsistence, justice. And it included both current and former officials in church-based development initiatives, Protestant and Catholic pastors, from both urban and rural areas, government bureaucrats, and persons steeped in the diversity of East African agricultural practices. What was evident in that gathering were the prominent divisions there between those advocating more and more effective church participation in NGO and state development projects under headings ranging from conservation and ecotourism to increasing agro-exports, and those who had ex experienced quite enough of those things and who wanted to try something different reclaiming land for subsistence production, creating demonstration farms to teach people both in rural and hyper-urban areas about ecological interactions and appropriate practices therein, much of which would fall under the permaculture umbrella for people who keep score on those things, and for expressions of discipleship that were at once more com communal, focused on the poor and vulnerable, and in opposition to efficiency norms that push people into more commodification of the natural beauty of their lands, into unforgiving labor markets, and away from their preferred vision of a life worth living. Um, some of what's going on you are already, is already old news to people in this room, or to people conversing with pastoral practices, and the dizzying number of local initiatives that engage these larger questions. Watershed preservation and shared use ventures, local and regional labor and producer cooperatives, numerous efforts to create restored or partial subsistence activities adjusted to new circumstances, the myriad versions of local food practices, solidarity production and consumption activities, for example, church-to-church -church production exchanges, community-supported agriculture, demonstration initiatives and training in, in, in types of, and practices of local food pro provisioning. I would draw your attention to the remarkable St. Jude Institute of Organic Agriculture and Sciences, founded by Catholic laywoman Josephine Kiza in Masaka, Uganda, as a, as a place well worth one's attention. Now, two things are apparent from a list like this. First of all, none of them are unfamiliar to people in this room, and certainly not in general terms, since none of them are novel in themselves. Second, the, develop, the dominant development industry can tolerate any and all of these practices so long as they remain insignificant, marginal, or peripheral. When they begin to impinge on local labor markets, commodity production levels, or access to resources, then they must be attacked as inefficient, backward, or threats to national progress. Should the church ever move beyond development, it can expect to be accused of national disloyalty and neo-feudal power seeking. Um, for lack of time, I'll, I'll skip a few other things, but there's one, there's one last set of questions I want you to think about, and that's, um, I think that the logical and the experiential endpoint of much of what has gone under the mantle of development in the last 70 years ends up portrayed in a, in a variety of places. One place I would encourage you to look is a book by Mike Davis called Planet of Slums. It's written in 2006. It's a book that's chilling in its detail, even as, as it's restrained in its, in its rhetorical flourishes. This book explains the past, present, and future of hyper-urbanization. The proliferation of megacities whose populations number in the tens of millions, most of whom populated by persons forced into substandard sprawling cavalcades of informal settlements. No urban services like water or sanitation, overcrowded and unsafe, and ecologically devastating and devastated zones, blast zones of modernity. Um, many of you will live and work in places like this. Two things that comes out of Davis's work and those of others is that 
these are not mistakes to be solved, but these are concomitant to the successes of development as practiced. These are not unfortunate byproducts. This is what, it, what you get when it works. And secondly, these are the areas in which military and strategic planners around the world are focusing their attention for the rest of my lifetime and well into yours. These are people who think about, 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 about wars and, and, and conflict, especially in light of present and future ecological dislocations. They are very interested in megacities. Military strategist David Kilcullen, for example, is among those who note the deep militarization of development itself the integration of humanitarian works and projects within larger sets of military interventions, objections, and strategies. Uh, Kilcullen describes a whole panoply of these in practice. My favorite one might be the work of one provincial reconstruction team. Provincial reconstruction teams are military units that have handfuls of civilian development experts embedded within them. You go in, you blow up an area, and then the development people come in to help rebuild on terms amenable to the military. It's a, it's a little bit like these strategic Hamlet programs the United States implemented in Vietnam in the 1960s, for example. Uh, my favorite is a provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan, which was in fact staffed by, the, by military and civilian personnel from the Missouri National Guard. Missouri not being known as a place from which military interventions in, in, in that part of Asia is very common, but it draws upon, and it, in fact, it took the form of what was called an agribusiness development team run by the Missouri National Guard, which brought the technical and corporate expertise and partnerships established by the land-grant universities in Missouri into rural Afghan districts to help them produce for external markets, to produce for, for increasing surplus for sale overseas, that this was an inseparable part of pacification. Um, I will stop here. There's, there's, there's more to be said, but I've presumed upon your patience. And, you know, don't, don't, don't take this as a, as a prescription for, for pessimism. I mean, I think, in fact, that the appropriate Christian response is always one of, one of hope. Um, Thomas Merton at the depths of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the United States and the Soviet Union were within hours of, dis of destroying the natural environment and the humans thereupon in 1962, wrote, quote, Christian hope begins when every other hope stands frozen still in the face of the unspeakable. See? It's cheerful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, as rich as those talks are, I think we're going now to questions and answers um, involving the audience. If I could ask you to please step to the center mic to ask your question so that we can have it on record and so that everybody can hear it. And if I could ask you please to make sure that you're asking a question, uh, the speakers will be available afterward for any comments or stories you may have to share with I think you're not Moran. Morning. Oh, is this one? So I, I very interesting morning and lots of good interactions with last night and earlier. Um, but it leads me to a question that we had a discussion at dinner about capitalism. And um, one thing I think we need to talk about capitalism, not capitalism. We're living in a particular type of capitalism which even Marx did not envisage. The degree of financialization, which, which Brown, for example, described, the use of war, um, that Michael just described uh, as a capitalist opportunity. These are things that even Marx did not envisage. So the, uh, the dematerialization, he only saw some of what was coming. Um, so I wonder if it's more helpful to talk about capitalism than capitalism. Uh, the, my other reason for saying that is because it, uh, once you start to say, oh, uh, capitalism, as if it's something that is some outside of capitalism. We're all in. So then, what is this outside? You know, we, we know some outside, for example, uh, Soviet bloc. As Cuba, I suppose, but you know, what is this outside? So, isn't it better to speak about capitalism? That's really my point. But the, my second point, and some of Michael's uh, comments about that uh, did connect to this, but it does seem to me that some of the alternative capitalisms are around, 
might include wider distributism, which is uh, which was a Catholic uh, teaching, not unconnected to Rarely Navarro, but I'm completely agreed with Mystic from St. Thessalonians. But I think um, some of the key texts of distributism in the mid 20th century still have uh, you know, significance. And it is, but it's not obviously anti capitalist or necessarily an anti Lockean, it's just that it's a significant revision of it. Um, uh, but, uh, and the other is the attempt to reconnect, to, to rematerialize uh, financial instruments in the economy. Uh, and this was actually the idea of Henry George, who was a late 19th, early 20th century uh, American political economist, in his book Progress and Poverty. He was influenced by the distributist ideas. It was about remapping financial onto land in particular. And his idea was that uh, essentially the citizens born in a particular territory have a right to that territory and its fruits, which is also biblical, it's also in the universal destination of goods concept and capital of teaching. And so you have to find a way to achieve that through the taxation system, which will include citizens' income, but it will also include land value taxation and the core taxation. And I can't describe all about that in detail. But having been so critical of capitalism last night, and capital, I just felt it was important to just put out a few. There are alternatives around them, and many of them are influenced by uh, Catholic and uh, Christian is not least the time to land as a kind of true rematerialization. Yeah. Well, I think the question of what constitutes capitalism is there's. Uh, I think that's one that, you know, competing ex explanations and understanding are likely to continue, whether there's a generic capitalism of which there are local and historical varieties and whether in fact there are substantive differences between them. Um, I think that I think that debate will continue. Is that better? Okay. Um, one of the things that I think confounds some of this is that capitalism has given a bad name to things like private property. It's, it, 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 it has conflated the notion of exchange with capitalism and they're not the same. Those predate what would by any definition historical framing predates capitalism by thousands of years. I mean, there are some problems with, with it, but the distinction made by the Hungarian uh, Karl Pol Polanyi between markets with a small m, which is where you take your goods that are surplus to what you've mostly grown or mostly made for yourself, where you take your surplus, as opposed to market with a capital M as the central organizing institution of society that dictates not only what you do, but how you do it, when you do it, and for whom you do it. But to, con to conflate those is a, is a category here. So, you know, I, I like things like the distributors. I, I, I think that there's, there's, no, there's no contradiction between some notion of private productive property and getting something other than capitalism. Um, I think it's... I think it's an open question whether things like the Soviet Union represented something external to capitalism in the, in the 20th century, rather than a state capital kind of institution. Those debates have gone on since 1970. Yeah, there's not much, I mean, I think I don't need to say much more than that, because I mean, there was a particular reason that I, that I really focused on capital rather than capitalism. Uh, more, more generally, and I think that debate is, 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 is absolutely crucial to have. Um, you know, uh, as Cathy, uh, Cathy Gibson Graham, Thomas, I would also argue that if you, um, if you, you know, through through this kind of critique, you can actually make something bigger than it, than it perhaps really is, or, or even more powerful. And so we have to be careful uh, not not to do that. We always look at the, the nuances, the cracks, and all of this. But having been confronted with exactly that question. Um, so the last week, when we got some reviews on our book, uh, Nature Incorporated, that asked exactly that question, what are the alternatives, what are the cracks? And we looked back at the book, and one of the things that we had found is that we actually hadn't emphasized the logic of capital enough in the book. Right? We, perhaps we, have, we hadn't emphasized the cracks and the, the alternatives and the autonomous, autonomous, uh, autonomous spaces in relation to capital enough, surely. But on the other hand, after we published that book last year, there's been an incredible intensification of violence in different conservation areas that we hadn't really dealt with in, in that book. And that has now, for me, sort of really captured, captured my attention. And uh, I also sort of personally, we talked about this yesterday, but personally, uh, 
uh, affected by this because some of these actors have actually co come directly at me, tried to intimidate me for the kind of analyses that I've, I've tried to put out there because I was simply naming them as being part and parcel of this process. Exactly the kind of process I think that Mike uh, laid, out, laid out quite well. So, yeah, we, we have to be, we have, I think the, 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 the crucial point is to, to be open to, to, to all these different uh, possibilities out there and not to colonize our own minds in pursuit of understanding a particular type of, type of logic. Can I ask a question of my colleague? Um, Jim, can you, can, you, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Um, I was wondering if you or maybe Bram could uh, help me understand a little bit more. I was intrigued by your notion of the you know, the, the non-use of nature as itself a, a stream of revenue or a, something to be, to be capitalized. Um, I was wondering if you could help me understand a little bit more about the history of the uh, offer since rescinded by the uh, president of Ecuador to uh, take, what was it, uh, uh, a 2.4 million acre section of national park land out of oil production in exchange for about three and a half billion dollars in revenue from the rest of the outside world, in effect paying them not to exploit their oil resources right. in an area that's like 20 like one third of all the amphibian species in the Amazon, is that something like that? And that was since pulled off the table. Yeah, yeah. That's the international community didn't want to pay. Yeah. I'm interested in it. Just, yeah. If somebody could tell me more, I don't know enough, enough about it. Jim, you want to first go? I'm sorry, I didn't really hear much of that. I heard something about Ecuador. <laughs> hold the mic closer, Mark. You gotta hold it real close to your mouth. Well, rather than waste people's time, Graham, you want to take a swing at it because you don't have the excuse that you didn't have to hear. <laughs> well, I think uh, I hope you can hear it, Jim. Then, then maybe you can add something to it, to, to what I'm saying. Because uh, Mike said you be asked about the notion of the, the non-use or the commercialization of the non-use of nature. And I, I, I have to be you know, uh, clear about this, uh, I, I, I didn't talk about this in, the, the, in my paper, but, uh, but or here in the presentation, but certainly in the paper I do, do say that it doesn't mean that, that you know, the non-use of nature doesn't actually mean that you don't somehow transform nature or, you, or, or, or produce nature in a different way. Um, but the whole idea is that you pay for labor to forego you know, the transformation of nature in such a way that it loses its, cap its capability to provide these kind of things called uh, environmental services. And in that sense, it's quite a, uh, we feel at least, it's, it's quite a profoundly different way of looking at sort of capitalist commodification and also why a lot of actors that are pursuing this have such a difficulties actually doing that in practice. Right? They, they, a lot of people thought that this kind of logic makes a lot of sense. You, you know, if you make it profitable not to use something, um, you know, you can make a market out of it, and you can conserve nature as much as you can use it, or you can destroy it. And you know, in fact, it makes it fit to offset the destruction of nature. For me, I mean, this is all offsetting industry. Obviously, flying over here, you can, you know, you can offset your flight and all of that. So the, the whole idea is that this is a different type of use of nature that leaves nature such that it can offset, that it can counterbalance destruction elsewhere. And that is quite a different idea about how you commodify nature from our sort of historical ideas about, you know, just chopping down a tree and making a table of it and sending it around the world as, 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 as material, as sort of physical capital. Um, so and that is what I think we have been trying to probe, like, in what ways is this different and, and, and what, does, what does that lead to? Um, I don't know, Jim, did you, did you hear any of that? Do you want to contribute to that? I didn't hear much of it, but I gather we're talking about the difference between the idea of, uh, of nature as priceless and then nature as something that you can uh, make exchange for and pay not to use. Yeah, the letter. What's that? The letter. The, the letter. The, the idea that you can make... But what's the specific question? How... Maybe Mike can... 
I was just curious, in, what, in our opening session on uh, Friday evening, Bill McKibben sent a recorded message. Um, and one of the things that he's made mention of several times is the, is the imperative to leave existing fossil ref fuel resources in the ground. If they are all surfaced and they are all used, we are all dead. So one way that some of the international conversations have thought about this was, why don't you pay people not to mine coal and drill for oil? The Yasuni Reserve in uh, Ecuador said, the president of the country said, give us $3.6 billion. That's half the value of the money of the proven reserves under the ground here. So give us half of what it's worth if we pump it out, and we'll not drill 840 million barrels of oil. They waited and waited, didn't come. Despite all the notions of the international community being willing to take real steps, this could have been something material and tangible that not only made steps toward improving things on climate change, but also protected an extraordinarily important area of biodiversity and local, local peoples and so on. And nobody showed up. Um, well, so the yeah. Norwegians paid some money, a couple of millions, but not enough. 3.6 billion is a lot of money. Uh -huh. I, I can't write that check, but yeah. So I was just wondering if that is, I mean, uh, I would love to know more about that because if, if it's il illustrative of the limitations of some of these approaches that both of you have described, elsewhere. Okay. Um, so I haven't heard anything about that in a long time. But, I, but the, the way you Secondly, at the same time, the oil price went down considerably, right? So that, that the material values, oh sorry, went up considerably. So the material values, you know, um, the material value of the oil to be extracted, you know, all of a sudden became much more attractive to Korea and to, to others. And second of all, this, this, this comes to the heart of the whole question. Right? Exactly. Are people then willing to forego certain other things or, for, or use money that could be spent otherwise to, uh, to, to, to save or to conserve nature? And for me, it's sort of the next project that, that, that I really want to get into is it, exactly that, the clash between modes of extraction and uh, modes of conservation. And increasingly, you, you see that extraction is becoming more violent and the, the sort of response to save nature is also becoming more violent. I think, uh, Michael, you, you referred to that yesterday, or, uh, I think uh, in Brazil that increasingly we see that environmentalists are being, being killed literally by the, by the dozens. I think, that, you know, in a couple of years' time there were over 180 that, 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 that were killed. And this is, you know, incredibly serious. But the reverse is also happening in South Africa. Over 300, 400 suspected poachers of rhinos, and I'm, I'm, you know, I want to emphasize suspected, because they haven't been tried, have been killed in the field. And I went into I went with several, several rangers, a private uh, military company, into the field that protects rhinos. And they literally told me, like, yeah, I mean, you know, if, if we see these people, you know, we take the first shot at them because, you know, uh, who, who the hell will ever find these people in a national park with, with dangerous lions, dangerous snakes, and all of that. And we, we throw some sand on them, and after three days, you don't see them anymore, you know. The, the corpse is gone, you know. You know, eaten up, and, and you know the whole area is, just, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And all the evidence is gone, and, and, and nobody will look for them in any event. And then, which is much easier than to have to go through all the legal procedures to defend yourself in court. And so there's, there's this intensification of violence going on to protect nature, but also to extract nature. And these these are come, going hand to hand more and more. I think in the for, in the foreseeable future, for me, it's absolutely crucial to to, to interrogate this empirically. <coughs> 